Hello, everybody. Oh, lovely to be here with you, Nir Erez you. from Move yep. It. Right, so if you haven't heard of Move It before, I've got a few statistics I want to read out to you by way of recap. 2,600 cities, 85 countries, and 44 languages. That's absolutely huge. Thank you, yes. It's quite uh, amazing to think about it when we just started six years ago. And this quarter, we just crossed the 300 million users milestone, side by side with uh, the coverage that you've just mentioned. We do cover uh, the largest area on the globe in regards of public transit information. We actually add a service in a new city every 15 hours. Every 15 hours, we add a new city to our repository, and we're serving hundreds of millions of people around the world. So can you s describe in a sentence what Move It actually is? So Move It is actually today uh, the aggregation of all mobility options that people have within the urban area, excluding driving a car. So it's all about public transit information combined with uh, on-demand ride hailing, scooters and bikes, which can take each and every one of you from point A to point B in any given time. So it's pretty much something that every single one of us in this room can relate to. We've all used public transport at one point or another and used technology in order to decide how we're going to get from A to B. But the big thing that really strikes me about Move It is the sheer scale of what you're doing. Can you take us through like the narrative of how you got to the point of where you are today? So I think that what helped us to get where we are today is a very early understanding that only 15% of the cities back then, six years ago, were actually had transit information uh, aggregated in a way that you could do something with it. So as much as it looks like a huge obstacle or a challenge, we saw that as an amazing opportunity to scale. Because once you're able to bring transit information to people on the street, they will very much uh, adopt it very quickly. You've been described as the Wikipedia of transit, and we'll talk about that in a second, because that's kind of like a headline for you. But I believe you have another headline you'd like to share with us today. Yes, so I want to take this opportunity today in front of you guys at Web Summit to announce uh, globally that we have just signed a strategic agreement with Microsoft, the second largest uh, company in the world, uh, to provide them all our transit data as part of Microsoft Azure Maps services. In this case, uh, Microsoft, I'm sure, pretty much looked around who can provide their the most comprehensive and most accurate transit data. And we are so proud to be selected to be Microsoft partner on that aspect. And by doing that, we will allow now hundreds of thousands of uh, developers around the world using Azure cloud services to get the most comprehensive public transit data available through their API. So we're very excited about this partnership and I'm quite sure that uh, it will contribute to so many different businesses around the world. I'm gonna be a bit bold or slightly cheeky in the next question I ask you. Where does that put you uh, when you think about the real heavyweights of maps like Google, for example? So I can you know, very easily say that on the transit level, Move It Today have about 70% more coverage than Google Maps. Uh, we actually can immediately connect that to your previous uh, remark about the Wikipedia of, of uh, transportation. And the reason why we have so much coverage and so much information is a lot of it is thanks to our amazing global community of volunteers. So I want to tell you something very interesting. I mean, out of the 300 million people that we have as users, about 1% volunteered actively to help us build transit data. And I'll tell you another secret. Not all of them were technically capable to do it, but out of this amazing group, 
about 400,000 and 70, 475,000 people were qualified as local editors. And this is what makes Move It so unique and give us such a huge power to build and maintain transit data around the world and make us, as I said before, by far the largest repository for transit data. So like almost half a million people volunteering to essentially crowdsource for you. How do you maintain the quality control and the accuracy of the information or data that's been collected? That's, that's an excellent question because none of these editors are allowed to publish data without monitoring process. So we have built a very uh, organized and sophisticated hierarchy level between our volunteers. So whenever somebody just, uh, you know, publish transit information, it goes through an approval process by other people that has to go and check and approve this data. As you get higher scores, you have been promoted in this pyramid of uh, uh, editors. So we have like seven degrees or seven layers of editors. You start at the lower level and you've been promoted all the way to a city manager, region manager, country manager, eventually at the end, at the top, these are the guys we call ambassadors. So they are all volunteers and they're managing this amazing pyramid of almost half a million people. So I'm sure you've got a massive vault of information that you can glean lots of learnings from. Can I ask you, are there any real practical examples of insights that you have learned about a transport ecosystem in a city that has you know, really informed the way in which that infrastructure and planning happens? So we are collecting today completely anonymously about 4 billion data points a day. Think four about billion. It, 4 billion data points a day. And we aggregate this information statistically. Most of this information is about people's movement within cities. When we take this amazing repository and we analyze it, we get very interesting conclusions. I want to share with you uh, one of our researchers that we have done in Boston to try and understand uh, why people are driving their car into the city and there's a train line, Firmingham train line, that is about 40 miles going into Boston and has like 18 train stations in the suburbs. When we analyze people movement, we identified a very um, interesting phenomena. At 7.30, pretty much in the morning, which is the worst hour to drive your car into the city, the number of people who drove into the city went up 50%. And it was almost unreal to see this phenomena, but when we analyze people's movement, what we saw is that people are actually driving into the train stations at the suburbs, turn around and drive to the city, and there was one main reason, no more parking spots. So if you think about this phenomena from a city perspective, before you could have this people's movement data, city planners were quite blind about this phenomena. And now they have multiple things they can do to solve it. They can add more parking spots, which is very expensive real estate, or they can increase number of buses or you know, the, the frequency of the buses, which is also not very efficient. But think about a new solution. Why don't they take some subsidy and give it to ride-hailing companies like Uber or Lyft or Didi and drive people into the train station so they don't need to park their car there. So information can reveal so many different phenomena that can improve our lives without adding more infrastructure. So you've tapped into two things I want to ask you about, probably separately. One is you've mentioned Uber and Lyft and to me it's impossible to talk about public transport without thinking about startups or media companies or tech companies that have uh, completely disrupted the whole ecosystem and you know how that's regulated and how that all fits and the second thing is you know what can decision makers do with the type of data that you are gathering because there's clearly a valuable commodity here in terms of the the information that you have how can that be used who needs to actually get involved in order to make 
meaningful changes so that it can improve people's lives in getting from A to B and potentially improve the environment as well, climate change, lots of other issues too. So I'll start with the second question yes. maybe. Uh, it's almost clear to think that in order to improve our transportation in cities, you need to invest in infrastructure. We claim that before you do that, with the current existing infrastructure, once you have more insights about how people move and what, how the demand look like, there's many ways to go and optimize the existing infrastructure, change frequency of buses, re reduce some if it's not needed and increase some where it's needed. And it's a lot about revealing new information uh, for the city planners and the municipalities. So I would say that before you go and invest in new infrastructure, data can, or the data that can be revealed in the last five or 10 years, changes the whole concept of how, what do we know about uh, the demand uh, and the supply in the city. And moving, the, I think it's a great seg, yeah, go ahead. But before you go into Lyft and Uber, um, one of the things that I guess a lot of people are thinking about now is their data and where it goes and who actually has access to it. Um, and the risks that are, is potentially involved with that. Um, how would you allay those concerns that people might have about their own private lives and about their personal security and their whereabouts and those kind of things? So we at MoveIt decided from day one that we're not going to aggregate or store any personal information. I think that the easiest way to deal with it is to try and look at the data on a statistical aspects of it. I mean, we aggregate every ride we take this information completely anonymously and eventually when it, it's aggregated statistically, there's no way to go back and check on a personal uh, behavior or move. Also, the data that we collect from users has nothing to do with their contact list or their personal information. It's just uh, a collection of moving points on the map. So we're trying very hard to stay away from collecting any personal information. Which is difficult to do in this day and age. You know, all, all of the big tech companies are having lots of challenges and grappling with that. I agree, and it really depends on the type or the nature of business you want and what you, would you like to achieve. When, when, lo when we look at uh, goals that are only related to mass transit, then we don't really need to deal with the dilemmas that relates to advertisement or any other uh, dilemmas that relates to collecting personal information. So let's talk about Uber, Lyft, and lots of other new modes of transport uh, that we have to look forward to that are really shaking things up. So there's no doubt that the ride hailing phenomena is here to stay. We're all using it around the world, it's amazing, but we see a very um, clear process where the disrupting companies are much, much faster and much more agile than uh, cities and regulators. So the phenomena looks like they're first starting and growing in a city and it takes sometimes years for cities to digest what's going on and start operating their regulatory forces to balance the phenomena. We saw that with the ride hailing that started to be regulated lately. Uh, we clearly see that with other mobility phenomena like scooters that are spread all over the city and in some cities it becomes a really hazard to walk uh, and, and in between these scooters. But eventually, if we think five to 15 years forward, there will be a balance between the very strong necessity of these services they are becoming complementary services to mass transit and how regulators can make sure that they're balanced demand and supply. Uh, the example I gave about Boston can easily be solved if only 5% of the subsidy that city of Boston or in the US gives buses will be shifted to ride hailing, to Uber or Lyft or whoever would like to take these people from home to the train station in a more efficient way. So there's also a very positive future for that kind of relationship. What about uh, taking action on the movement of vehicles through cities, such as a congestion charge? I mean, in the UK, in London, where I live, there's a congestion charge on cars going through the city, and it's a deterrent for people to 
uh, go there. Um, you have all of the data, so you have the inside track on what needs to be done. Yes, and I think we're not really generating this phenomenon, but we, we watch it very closely. As you can see in Europe, more and more cities starting to restrict areas uh, and prevent private cars from getting into these areas. That kind of decision has to come with a very tight um, solution for public transit. Otherwise, you know, it will kill the area. Uh, in a way, you see today that regulatory forces prevent big, new big buildings to have too many parking uh, spaces because they don't want cars to get into the city. Um, it's a phenomenon that we're looking at, uh, we're watching it from a statistical perspective, but it's also something that we're trying to help and explain or help cities understand what solutions they have to provide before they take these actions and restrict areas from uh, letting car getting into these areas or getting any congestion fees. We have just over a minute left, but um, if you could recap based on the things that you have learned over the last six years, and I'm not asking you for all of your trade secrets, where do you see the future of urban transport going? Um, I definitely try to combine all the new initiatives that start from the disrupting uh, ride-hailing companies uh, together with what are we going to see in the next five to 15 years uh, with autonomous vehicles phenomena. And one thing is pretty clear to us, mass transit is here to stay. One rail can move 35,000 people an hour one, once uh, one car lane can only transfer 2,000 people an hour. So we all understand that mass transit is here to stay. But what I believe will happen is that the friction that we have today about moving between one mode of transportation to another will start to, to eliminate uh, or to be eliminated uh, by the fact that we'll pay one uh, app to have the full trip that includes a train, a bus, or an autonomous vehicle, or even a scooter. So I think the multimodality is going to be the future of our urban, uh, our urban mobility by all means, payment and usage of different modes of transportation. Nir Eris, it's been absolutely, an absolute pleasure talking to you. Thank you very Same much. Here. Good Thank luck you with so what much. you do next with Move It. Thank you. Thank you.